Okay, so let's go over the Zoll E series we carry here at Rockham County MS. Notice it's a very easy laid out pad. We have the monitor side, which you can see is gray, and all the monitor buttons correspond to it. Then, if you see to the right of that, we have the defibrillator side, which is red, and you can see all the buttons that correspond to that. Today, we're going to be focusing right here on this green section, which is the pacer side. Hello. Today, we're going to go ahead and cover the Zoll E series biphasic pacing unit. By the end of this objective, we're going to talk about defining the difference between electrical and mechanical capture. We're going to understand what the pacer rate dial and the pacer output dial is. We're going to talk about pad placements and why we still have to use electrodes. We're going to tell the difference between the three types of demand, standby, and asynchronous pacing. We got to get this patient prepped. So we need to make sure they're dry and the chest is dry so we can apply the status pads to them. Notice that we are using a four lead EKG here at Rockham Kenny MS. Both need to be in place uh, either in demand or standby mode. Now they do talk about asynchronous pacing. We'll cover that more later in the video. We need to explain to the patient that he is going to feel some discomfort and sometimes premedicating the patient, if possible, is a good idea with some type of sedative being Ativan. Realize that you can touch the patient and still check for a pulse, for instance, when the milliamps are being discharged. Because of the negative flow technology, it goes between the two pads and not out throughout the whole body like you think normal electricity would go. Okay, the status pads are applied to the apex front and back. This is anterior and posterior on a patient. I know it says three lead ECG. We use the four lead ECG. Uh, there are different versions of the Zoll, but I just wanted to cover that again. It's very important that we put these pads, not like when we put it in defibrillation mode, we need to put it on the apex front on the back. That way the electricity has the best chance of going through the adipose tissue and bone to reach the heart to cause ventricular depolarization. Okay, one thing to go back to cover that we showed in the first part of this video is what we're working with today. We're going to be working in the access pacer green mode. And everything we're worrying about today is going to be in that little green sweatshirt with the other soft first round, last round key on the bottom. Uh, notice that when it is in pacer mode, no AD capability or analyze button can be used in this mode. So if something happens and they go into ventricular tachycardia or, defib or go into ventricular fibrillation, then we need to switch into defibrillator mode to be able to defibrillate this patient. Okay, let's talk about the pacer mode. Let's talk about the rate dial. Uh, it's a little bit different than some of the units we used to have when we had the LifePak 11. On this one, it is a spin dial, of course, and it's automatically defaulting down to about 70 beats per minute or 70 pulse per minute. So we need to stay focused on that. Leave it about 70, 80. That's our range we're going to work in. The biggest thing we're going to be working with is the next dial over, which is in the milliamps. Like the first dial we see here, which is pointed out in this PowerPoint, is actually going to be the milliamps. This is where the power that we're adjusting. So if you're, the rate is how fast the heart's going to be beating, the milliamps is how much energy is going to be delivered every time that the pacer attempts to catch her. Our goal is to keep it at the lowest possible milliamps to do the less damage to the heart itself. All right, I get a lot of questions on this all the time. Somebody asked me, what is capture? There are two types of capture. There's electrical capture, which means that you actually can see the electrical pulse wave taking over the QRS. On the bottom there, that you can see for every pacer spike, there is a QRS complex to follow. On a patient where there's not electrical capture, you'll see the pacer spike away from the QRS. When it is electrical capture, Notice that the pacer spike is right before the QRS defibrillates or right before the actual contraction of the QRS takes place. So the electrical capture is doing exactly what we think. Now, mechanical capture. Do we or do we not have a pulse when this actually shows? And how do we feel that? We check the pulse. We put our hands on the radio and see if we can feel a beat for every time that we see electrical beat. Once that you have that, you have some electrical mechanical capture has been confirmed then dial the milliamps up a rough about 10 percent of the capture threshold just to keep you inside the safety margin so we're going to go up by 20 until we get capture back off just a little bit to what we sustain capture then go back up about five that's the rule of fives that we had once before now one of the questions i get a lot of times and i've been teaching hcls since 1995 and one question i hear from a lot of people everywhere 
uh, from physicians, which are general practitioners, to PAs, to uh, RNs, to nurse practitioners, to paramedics, is this question. What is the difference between demand pacing and standby pacing? Well, there are two major differences to that. Uh, demand pacing, the best way to give you an example of that is, I have a patient that has a heart rate of 30. And let's say he says he's in a third degree block. And I'm deciding to pace this patient. So I set the intrinsic rate or my rate of control, the PPM, up to about 70 beats per minute. Well, then I go back and I take the milliamps and increase to take capture of the heart. Once I have capture of the heart, then I'm controlling the rate of the heart. That's demand pacing. I'm demanding that heart rate to stay at 70 beats per minute. And I'm controlling it as the pacemaker site for the heart. Now, when we talk about standby pacing is we take capture of the heart. We've got it. We set up the beat per minute so we can actually set what we want. We go up to achieve 100% capture of the heart. Then we start to actually decrease the actual beats per minute or the PPM. We start decreasing that back to a certain rate. Uh, prime example, they're running in the 30s, but they're running periods of being in the 80s and 90s. Then we set the BPM to 60, as long as the heart rate stays above 60, that pacer is not going to kick on. But as soon as that heart rate dips down below 60, the monitor is going to sense it and it's going to start capturing and taking over the heart rate again. So it's very simple to understand. Demand pacing, we set the rate, we keep it there. Standby pacing, we're going to take over the heart, control the beats per minute, but we're going to put it down a little bit lower than the intrinsic rate for a safety valve. So it is very effective. This is a really uh, interesting topic, uh, asynchronous pacing. I've been asked this numerous times by different crew members once we got the E-Series in. This is the first time we've been able to do asynchronous pacing. What is it? Well, let's just say you have a patient with severe burns or a patient with severe trauma or something interferes from you being able to put the electrodes onto the patient, What you gives us our base rhythm to do what we're dealing with. Well, in that situation, it's considered asynchronous pacing. There's a soft key, which is the very last round soft key, which I showed you in the pre-video about the actual E-Series monitor. And this we need to talk about. What happens is we go in and we can't really control the you know, pulse beats or pulse pace per minute. We actually have to go in and just see if we have mechanical capture by holding on to the wrist as we're trying to do it and palpating a pulse. That's the only way we can do it with asynchronous pacing. Again, very rarely used. We don't do this at all. It's not recommended, but in the significant situations where you have a patient, let's say, has significant burns all over their body or something where we really can't place the electrodes on there, but we can get the pads on there, then this would be the position that we'll be in that we have to actually consider asynchronous pacing. And one of the last things we're going to talk about in this uh, PowerPoint is talking about the 4 to 1 button. I have heard tons of people saying, what is the 4 to 1 button? Well, really, it's very simple. It really pauses the viewing of the milliamps on the screen for four beats. So you, you, you get to see four true rhythm beats so we can tell what the underlying rhythm is. Are they still in the third degree block? Has our pacing work? Were they in just a bradycardic induced by hypokalemia? You know, what exactly is causing this to happen? And uh, are we doing our job to get the rate up? And again, it's just a way to view the rhythm for just four beats. That's why it says four to one. You get four beats that does not show the milliamp. doesn't mean the pacer's not working. It just doesn't show the milliamps of the actual pacer spikes on the ECG output. Okay, this concludes the PowerPoint part of the presentation. Uh, and again, if you have any questions, please contact the system training office, and we'll be glad to answer any questions you have on this. the pacing units. You can schedule time to come by, maybe on duty, if we get a uh, call permitting, to come by and actually practice this. So let's first see, notice my lead two is on here, so I do have my four leads in place. I am in the monitor position this time, so I'm gonna quickly switch it over to the actual uh, defib section. Now look what happened, I took a long time to switch that. Since I took a long time to switch it, the monitor went in recovery mode. So if we switch it quick, as you see here, oh, there's a blooper for the blooper reels. <laughs> when you see me switch it this time, we're gonna switch it over quick, and there we go straight into the actual rhythm. So here we go, we got the pacer turned on now. Notice my BPM is only at 70 beats per minute. And you notice we're still staying in the green section. Everything we're worried about is down here on the very bottom. We do have the asynchronized pacing key here. If I turn it on, you see it says asynchronized pacing, which will only mean the pads are connected and nothing else. So we just pop the button again to turn it off, just in case we actually turn it on. And there we go, we're back into the pacing mode. So, 
Notice the milliamps is set to zero, so we're going to have to control that. 70 is the actual intrinsic rate that's set. You can see we can adjust that up or down by this dial. Now we're looking at the actual milliamps. So let me get my hand out of the way here so you can see better. So I'm going to try to adjust this a little bit. And we're going to try to get some capture. So we're going to turn up, and the rule of thumb is go up by 20s until you gain capture. Okay, I was at 20. I didn't have any capture. Let's hit 40. Still no capture. Whoa, here we go. We're hitting 46, 48. We're starting to see some capture. Um, starting to see some effective pulse rate, so I'm up to 60 because again we're going up by 20s to get capture this rate. So now I'm at 60 milliamps. I'm having successful capture. Notice my pulse right there. You can see, you see one intrinsic beat that could happen anytime. Uh, again, this is hooked up to a mannequin, so we're practicing on a mannequin today. Uh, notice that you see a pacer spike, and then followed by a axle QRS. We are going to turn it down now. We're going down by five. Hadn't lost capture. Let's go down just a little bit more. Okay, um, down the 48 range right now. I still got some capture. Uh, it's looking good, so I'm just going to be happy with that. I'm going to go ahead and assess my vital signs and see what I have. Now, if I go below it, you can see I've just lost capture. So go back up a little bit. At 50, I've got capture. So the most important thing is here, when you just up or down, don't be scared if you lose capture, but this is just electrical capture. How do we know it's true to capture? We have to fill a pulse. If I can fill a pulse, see the difference. Now, I just hit the 4 to 1 button to show you the difference between a 4 to 1. You get one true beat and then four regular electrical beats. That's the 4 to 1 button in action. It's pretty neat. It gives you an idea of seeing what the underlying rhythm is. Please make sure, though, your leads are in, connected to the patient and that you are trying to assess the vital signs of this patient. Now, here's an up close view of it notice my milliamps are on 38 so really i know i don't have capture now because i had the uh, mannequin set up for an intrinsic rate of 50. Now, the closer i get notice i've hit the 50 threshold i'm starting to get capture there's the big difference there you can see the actual qrs following the pacer spike it is pretty neat i'm at 60 milliamps um, intrinsic rate is set to 70. all right that's every minute there's 70 beats coming out of this pacemaker site now which is externally built into the monitor the most important thing to remember is make sure you reassess the patient